years worth of, of just participating in that work and that venture. Um, back in the days of old, we had things called poor houses. Those transitioned into county homes. We've transitioned into community-based service. Along the way, the funding streams have changed. It used to be the cities and the counties were the sole funder for individuals with mental health and disabilities. Along the way, the federal government has kicked in in the form of Medicaid as well as Medicare in some instances. And then state of Iowa has had growth and development with the onset of managed care organizations. Um, being a participant in that, which lands us to today, of which there's several funding streams. So in the funding stream structure today, the region is completely a state allocation. Just last year, there was property tax um, that was included in the mix of that, but now it is a state allocation. The role and responsibilities of regions is to be the gap filler and the um, developer of services at the local level of things that the Medicaid system does not provide for. Medicaid has a lot of rules and regulations in regards to service and what is allowable cost in the Medicaid service system. So the regions really focus in on service development with all of our partners locally. And there's lots of familiar faces here today. So shout out to Hope Haven, who has been a long-term partner for the Southeast Iowa Link region, has been serving the community here in Burlington and several of the counties um, across the SEAL region and the good work that they do. There's other partners that uh, we accredit to making the service system work here at the local level. The hospital has been a huge um, contributor to assisting individuals that experience mental health, brain health, intellectual disabilities, developmental disability conditions. Um, Counseling Associates is here locally and assists with care coordination for populations. Young House Family Services has attended to the needs of children here locally for a good many years lengthy history there also. We also partner with um, many of the state agencies, vocational rehabilitation, workforce development, local law enforcement, the sheriff's department and the police department. We have lots, lots of partners in this venture of assisting those individuals that struggle with mental health and brain health conditions. So with that being said, some of the most recent onlining of services in the world of mental health and um, disability services um, can be attributed to legislators, actually. The regions have what is identified as core services. And in those core services, there was a profound um, perspective that there was need for crisis services as well as services to individuals with complex needs. So some of the crisis services that we have locally here in Southeast Iowa and specifically here in Burlington is the Crisis Stabilization Residential Center that Hope Haven runs. And it assists individuals that are in mental health crisis are not, good morning, are not necessarily um, in need of inpatient acute psychiatric treatment, um, but attends to what the mental health crisis is and allows for not only the treatment of that mental health crisis condition, but also assists with transitioning back into the community so that individuals can be successful wherever they are at and live in the community being in their own home um, in the community or a site home that has assistive staff that attends to their needs and assists them with gaining the optimum level of independence that they need. We also have a co-occurring program um, that Hope Haven runs also that addresses individuals that have mental health conditions as well as substance use disorders. 
something that is highly needed in our area. Unfortunately, it's needed, but thankfully we have that resource available to us. As I indicated earlier, the hospital has been a good partner throughout the years. We have inpatient psychiatric. Um, we also have uh, therapists and psychiatrists available to us through Great River Mental Health. Counseling Associates, I alluded to earlier, does um, adult integrated health home coordination um, that assists individuals in navigating the system of Medicaid and acquiring services. And Young House Family Services does pediatric integrated health home, which helps coordinate services for children and their families in navigating the system as well as accessing Medicaid services. The region being the gap filler, we assist individuals that do not have Medicaid insurance um, in navigating that system and become the sole funder um, for individuals that are at 150% federal poverty level. And besides that, we assist individuals in acquiring other resources that they need in order to be successful. Um, some of those peripheral things um, we call social determinants of health. Housing is a huge component. It's hard to be healthy when you don't have housing. So the region assists with housing, um, assist with the cost of housing in some situations, along with the County General Assistance Program. And Lisa, I'm looking at you. Shout out to them for the good work that they do at Community Action. Um, we also attend to um, transportation needs on occasion and connecting with the local resources there. Again, it's hard to get healthy going to doctor's appointments if you don't have a means to get to your doctor's appointments. Telehealth has been a game changer for accessing health care services, um, but it does not necessarily solve all problems for all folks. You have to have the technology available to you as well. So other than that, we also connect for medical conditions and ensure that we're attending to the needs of the whole person as we go along. I can't stress enough that it is so important for the work of regions as the local public facing entity for everybody that lives in the community. And today I have with me Ken Heineman, who is the Des Moines County Local Point of Access Coordinator of Disability Services. Um, he is the face of Des Moines County in assisting individuals in gaining access to services here. So with that, I'm going to try to be brief. So I would open it to any questions that anybody would have. Okay. <clears throat> We're good. No questions online. Anything? Okay. All right, Ryan, we appreciate you taking the time this yes. morning and, and talking with us and giving that brief description. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we will dive into the questions. Thank you, Senator Reichman and Wolfren, again, for being here. We'll start off with the first one. So the Greater Burlington Partnership has identified providing a full spectrum of mental health care in our region as one of its top priorities in its 2023 public policy agenda. How can the state of Iowa assist to identify methods to establish quality for, for rural Iowans to easily access services? We'll start with you, Jeff. All right. <laughs> Sorry for being a few minutes late. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Last year, we allocated an extra $60 million for mental health. Um, the problem is, is getting providers um, out in these rural areas. So something else we did over the last couple of years was, was telehealth. Um, and then um, something that your organization uses is, is the uh, redemption center, so the bottle bill. So there's lots of different funding streams that we've utilized. And the other thing is opening up um, the channels to get providers, because I think that's one of the biggest obstacles. Um, is providers in our area. 
um, for mental health, um, having psychologists um, in our area, um, in the state of Iowa, uh, let alone just in our area. So um, that's something else we did was open up an incentive program to, uh, to, to try to entice um, people into that field. So a lot of different things. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'll use the horse to water analogy. Um, we're, I think we're trying to build the pond um, and make it so that people want to come to this area, want to come to Iowa and provide those, um, those mental health services. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think between Ryan and also Jeff, a few things I might be repeating, but um, the Iowa Republicans have already made substantial policy and funding commitments to improving mental health access services and, and sustainable in the state. Um, we created the Children Mental Health System to coordinate uh, mental health services for kids. That was in 2019. I know Tom Green, who's here, was involved with that a lot. Uh, we ensured students have access to mental health uh, resources they need by allowing telehealth uh, in, in schools. I know that was mentioned, but that was in 2020. We established a mental health loan repayment program, a house file to uh, 20, or 2449 in uh, 2022. And I actually, um, I had, uh, I've had a few of the directors that have been at my budget sub economic development and they had mentioned um, that they thought that that was very effective and they think we should expand that further. So, um, and then also we provided approximately 125 million for mental health and uh, providing a sub sub uh, sustainable source of funding for mental health and eliminating the county mental health property tax levy, saving over $100 million annually. And now that was in 2021. And then I know the uh, telehealth was brought up and I think, um, I think we, you know, that's available. I think we do, we need to work a little bit on the technology and help some of the providers. And then, um, then as far as uh, we've uh, working now on eliminating certificate of need for establish, establishing community mental health providers. Um, there's been, there's a couple different bills that are in right now. Brad Zahn has a bill and also the Committee on Health and Human Services has a, has a bill on eliminating certificate of need. And um, so, like I said, I think that's something that uh, we'll, be, we'll be working on. Uh, we are working. Um, we are working uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services and released a report on mental health. And I do have that with me if anybody wants it. But that actually just came out in January. So um, I have not. I, and I want to mention too, I'm not on Health and Human Services, but I do care deeply about this because my district cares about it a lot. And uh, I've learned a lot over the years, you know, from Tom Green, who's here, because like I said, he's been very, very involved. I don't know if Jeff, are you on? Health and Human Services? I'm not either. Okay, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. So we all have our committees. And before I leave today, I want to review what committees I'm on too. I'll talk about that a little bit too. So, but um, anyway, and also um, I wonder, um, and, and Jeff will probably talk about it, but the rural emergency hospital thing, I'm sure he's got plans. Ton of, that's his bill. So he'll, he'll talk <laughs> about that. So I'll let him, I'll let him at some point talk about that and I'll elaborate because I, we had an amendment on that bill that just, just passed a couple of days ago. All right. Okay, so the second question is kind of a loaded question. So staying on the topic of mental health care, what can the state do to alleviate workforce barriers, obstacles for direct support professionals and improve coordination between and across service providers and possibly entry points, including improvements with the data systems? Senator Lothgren, okay. you want to start with you? Yeah, so uh, a couple of bills that have been introduced is Senate Study Bill 1104, a bill that would establish a state-funded psychiatry residency and fellowship program. Um, I did, um, and like I, like I mentioned that, I do believe that some of these programs, I believe it's like 150000 per each resident, but um, I think that, like I said, as I've talked to some of the directors um, from workforce and everything, they do think those are effective. And then we have um, a bill that would prohibit employers from requiring a certain mental health professionals uh, as far as non-competing agreements. So um, I'd be curious what everybody thinks about that, but I think I think that makes a lot of sense too. And then uh, and so like and like I mentioned earlier, um, Director Townsend really um, she um, being the chair of the Economic Development Budget Sub, we have a lot of the directors that come in. So. Uh, when workforce came in uh, with a bunch of the staff people and everything, and that was uh, Director Townsend, 
again, she talked about the forgivable loans. And then one thing that I, um, I think is very important too is that um, Debbie Durham, who's the director of IFA, Iowa Finance Authority, and I, the Iowa Economic Development Authority, she had mentioned probably our biggest challenge really is population. I think most people will agree with that. And I think we're doing a, I think we're doing a good job um, when you compare other states like over in Illinois, um, I was mentioning to people that um, with the census, the 10 year period of time for the census, Illinois lost like 80,000 people, but last year they, they lost 104,000 people. So when you think about that, I mean, at least we're kind of gradually growing and everything. And so, like I said, I think we need to work, we need to work on population. Senator Eichmann. Well, <clears throat> with uh, a lot of the programs that we implement, and we've, like I said, we've done several, Mark and I mentioned a few, over the last uh, two sessions and things we're working on this session. Unfortunately, it's not like a light switch. Things don't happen instantly. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of slow to, to come to fruition. So, um, but yeah, I think it, we realize this is a, a tough subject. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said several times that, you know, if people don't receive the proper mental health, um, if they don't receive the proper diagnosis, proper medications, then they tend to self-medicate. and We have a big issue with that in our area. So um, this is important to a lot of us. And I know uh, I just talked to Senator Edler last night um, about the, the rural emergency hospital but topic, but um, I know this is something on his mind too, is, is continuing to um, find solutions for mental health um, because it is such a problem in our areas, especially in our rural areas. So, um, you know, we're, we're just gonna keep working through the processes and 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 uh working on the priorities and and uh, I, I as mark said with the with the growth we have i think slow and steady is, is a good is a good way to go um obviously not losing like uh like other country or other uh states are so um we just want to keep continuing to grow in this area and, and keep implementing um projects and um things that that help uh help grow in this area. And, uh, you know, I, I think barriers, workforce barrier, you know, usually the biggest thing is pay. And I, we've heard this several times that, uh, you know, people that work in the um, extended living care and, and with your organization, um, it's, it's the wage is so small um, that it's tough to get people to go into the field and you're understaffed, you're understaffed in your area. So, uh, the problem is um, with this inflation that we've had the last two years with this administration is just so astronomical. It it's almost doesn't matter what we do. We can't keep up with it. So um, we hope that that slows. Um, we don't have any indication of that yet. Um, they say it's slowed to 6%, but that's an annual. So it's 6% on top of the 8% last year. So um, I, I don't see it turning yet, but we, we keep hoping that uh, um, that will level off and plateau so we can start um, kind of knowing where the baseline is and build from there. Great, thank you. Um, so um, what was your biggest takeaway from the Southeast Iowa days earlier this month, Senator Eichmann? Um, great group, big group, and thanks for everybody. Um, I see a lot of people that were that were there, so thanks for coming up. And, you know, the biggest thing I see is, you know, we just have so many great people um, doing great things and lots of different organizations and uh, you know we're all have the common goal of making the area better and you know my biggest takeaway is um, like I said so many great people <clears throat> we just need to make sure that we are um, all rowing in the same direction and rowing together so uh, coordination between the groups um, there's a lot of overlap um, and uh, just keep people energized and uh, and keep our best face on and let people know what we have to offer here in Southeast Iowa. All right, thank you. Senator Lofgren. Yep, so every day we're kind of racing all over. So it ended up that um, the high school students with the Empower You group were down at the historical building right by the Capitol. So um, a couple of months ago, I kind of got a little injury and I'm kind of limp, been limping around, but, I, but I, I limped on down to that, down the building, down the street there. And uh, so I got there just, just about the time it started. So I, um, and, and I know uh, Matt was there um, too. And uh, so they, they present, I was there for about a half an hour and uh, they really did a nice job. They really, I, I was so impressed with them. 
they they knew the issues well that they talked about um and every time somebody asked a question they were they they really had a good answer right away and everything too so i thought it was great um i had to leave because we had a caucus so i raced back to the capitol um but then of course later later on um at one of the receptions that, that they had had an opportunity to visit with the students and everything too so again i was really i thought it was great i think i think it's a it's a nice thing you're doing for them, getting them up the capital and everything too, so they understand how policy works and everything. Great, great. All right, so little conversation before we kicked off. We think the governor signed this already this week, but we're gonna talk about it anyway. So Senate file 181 and its companion bill, House Study Bill 120 are currently in the respective Ways and Means Committee. This is legislation lowers valuations immediately upon passage and will mean an additional lowering of local government's levies based on residential rollback. What insights can you give on this and its effect on our area? Senator Lofgren, we'll start Yeah, here. so the Department of Revenue, um, they made an error. I guess they knew about it in the fall, but uh, I guess you know they're talking back and forth and never really got resolved. And so what it had to do with is the rollback. Um, so it, um, they had it at 56.5% uh, versus it was supposed to be 54.6. Uh, so what happened was is that obviously there's going to be less revenue going in, but, le but less taxes paid by the public, though. And so um, what came from that basically is we, we extended out the deadline to April 30th uh, to give more flexibility for the budget being certified. But again, I believe it, it, it I be, I'm pretty sure it was just um, signed recently. If not, it'll be really soon. So that's the situation. All right, Senator Reichman. Yeah, it's, uh, I mentioned earlier, inflation and with everybody's cost going up to then have, um, not have as much in the budget as, as you kind of expected, it, it's a tough place to be. Um, it's unfortunate and it was a mistake. Um, it's it's easy to adjust income up, but when you have less money to deal with, it's not easy at all. And especially as tight as the budgets here uh, are here at the county level, um, you know we uh, it's unfortunate. And and uh, I I've, my supervisor has been very vocal, and I'd like to get some information. Do we we have some of the county supervisors here from the one county? Okay, um, I'd like to hear from them because there's another bill coming up. Um, that would be a larger impact than this one would. So I'd like to hear from them and uh, have some bullet points. I'm putting together a letter to go to the chairman and uh, uh, president of the Senate and Senate Majority Leader to kind of show the impacts it would have here in Southeast Iowa. So um, um, because like I said, the other bill that's going through right now through ways would be a larger impact than this one. So um, I'd like to provide leadership um, some insight on that and what it, how the impact would be. Um, this one, just an unfortunate circumstance, and I, I, we kind of go through the same thing. We're given a budget um, out a few months, and then we are going through the budgeting process now, and uh, <clears throat> we don't get the final until March. So kind of the same thing. We, we will get a final here in a few weeks that will adjust up or down um, what our allocations are. So we'll have to adjust accordingly. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's the circumstance. All right, uh, Senator Lofgren, let's sh have you share some updates on legislation you have introduced this, yeah. this session. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, I'll go ahead and go over what committees I'm on. Um, I'm the chair of the Economic Development Budget Sub. I mentioned that earlier, but um, so this, this, this week we actually had you and I there and they presented, and then next week we'll have Iowa State. And then uh, kind of interesting, uh, Governor Branstead now um, is with the World Food Prize, so he'll be presenting this week too. So um, he was—he's been over the Capitol a couple of times talking about that. So there, um, it's like the Nobel Prize for food and hunger, and so um, pretty, pretty exciting. So, um, like I said, um, we'll we'll have a presentation from him in Iowa State um, coming up, and so, but um, and then um, I'm on—I'm the vice chair of the local government. I'm on, and I'm on full appropriations. I'm on rules and administration. I'm on veterans affairs, which Jeff is the chair of that one. And then I am on IPERS. I was on IPERS. Oh gosh, I've been on there for a long, long time. And then I had a little bit of break because I had other things to, I was responsible for, um, but I'm back on IPERS again. And then I'm also um, the systems retirement plans. That's where we look at all the retirement plans. And actually we won't be doing that until um, next, next fall. So, but, uh, and then I'm also, um, I, mean, I just I want to mention too that the um, 
the session, we're, we're moving a lot quicker than normal. It's really kind of amazing. I think Jeff will agree with this. And there's kind of a push because sometimes we'll just, we'll, we'll get all, we'll work on all the, all the subcommittees and committees, and then we'll basically, everything will pile up. And all of a sudden we've got more bills we can keep up with, but we're being pretty consistent in everything, which I, which I think is a good idea. And so then um, some of the bills, and I mentioned some of this last time, but uh, Senate file six is a bill that um, this has to do with uh, homes for Iowa. And I mentioned this last time, some of you might not have been here, but um, that's where up in Newton, they're making, they're building homes in the stream around the state and everything. And so um, we're finding it's lowering recidivism. And so what I'm trying to do is do similar to what Habitat um, has for them is that um, there's no tax on materials that they buy and everything. So um, we're working on that bill. Um, we're working on Senate file 182 that has to do with uh, its land redevelopment trust. Um, and it's really, um, we've named it that now. It was called land banks, but we feel like the, we found that the bankers didn't really like that name to have banks in there. So, uh, so anyway, that's a situation where you can do a 28E, you could have the counties and you can have the cities uh, together. And what you're doing is accumulating property that they, that they just can't do anything with. And you're trying to tee it up for a developer um, to develop it. And so I'm working on that. And um, we're actually, uh, we're farther along. We, we've actually had it, we had it out of a local government unanimously before we had it. Um, I think it's the third time now we've had it out of ways and means. So I know it can be frustrating for the public, but it is for us too. Sometimes we work on bills and, and we're trying to get them to do it on the floor. And so, um, but so now we have it out of ways and means, ready for the floor on the Senate. And then it is, it is out of the subcommittee over in the House, so they're getting ready to do that in their committee. And then um, I have a bill, um, Senate File 11, and this has to do with the uh, Department of Transportation. And what we want to do is we want to have them be fair and consistent and have seven different districts uh, where, where there's representatives instead of having everybody from the Polk County area. So, and uh, so the good thing is there, I'm having difficulty getting the governor's office wanting, wanting to do that bill, um, but the house just got it out of committee. So who knows, maybe, maybe something will happen this time. So um, there's a few legislators up in the, up in the Clinton area that feel like that, that they're not paying attention to them there. And so um, they're, they may, they may get things going. And then um, in the veterans affair committee, um, we, um, we currently out in the health and human services budget, we have $2 million for veterans for housing grants to buy homes for down payments um, and closing costs. And so um, the $2 million, um, keep, it always runs out. Normally about March, um, the money runs out. So, um, so anyway, we tried to do $2 million more last year. Couldn't seem to find it in the budget. We got, the, we got the bill out of the committee, out of Veterans Affairs, but we couldn't seem to find the money. So uh, what we've done is we've kind of fine-tuned it. We're, we're trying for 500000 we think is a really good number. So, we're, um, so we're, we have that one and probably won't know much on that until we get into the budget. And I do think we're going to work on our budget maybe a little bit sooner than normal too. So which I think is great. And then um, I'm working on, I mentioned last time, I believe I'm working on a couple bicycle bills. And so um, right now, if you, if you were to, uh, if you were to um, basically run into a um, bicyclist, what happens is you'd be fined $325. But if you and if you seriously injured that bicyclist, um, you would also be fined the same thing. If you killed them, you'd be fined the same thing. But it's different. If 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 someone were were to hit a pedestrian or they would hit a vehicle, um, there's accelerated type of um, penalties and stuff, and you may lose your license. So what we're trying to do is be consistent, and we're trying to change that so that um, it's the same same type of a thing. Um, I, I mentioned, I think last time to you that being, you know, I'm in Muscatine along the river, like you guys are, and rag is a big thing for us. Um, a lot, I have a lot of friends that are bicyclists. I'm a runner. And so I, I, I know a, a lot of bicyclists. So that, and that one, I think, um, I'm, I'm assuming we'll probably do that on the floor pretty quick here. And then the hands-free bill is, um, that's basically where we want to have people instead of just holding onto their phones, we want them to go ahead and use the technology, either, either an accessory with their vehicle or build into their vehicle 
And so, um, and what it's kind of, um, I mentioned, it's kind of cat and mouse with the house because they're saying, well, if you guys do it, we'll do it. And so it kind of, it's like, who's going to do something here? So, um, so anyway, I, it's, it sounded, it sounds promising. And the uh, Iowa Bicycle Coalition has been in the capital many, many times. Actually, they've been there with some uh, victims that um, have been affected by um, distracted drivers. And so then, um, let me see here. Oh, um, in uh, in Veterans Affairs, I'm working on, um, there's a monument um, that they want to put at the Capitol. It's really pushed from Cherokee, Iowa, Martin Treptow. And he was um, in World War I, and um, he, he, he died um, Ju July of 1918. And so um, he's best known because he had the Treptow Pledge. And I'm going to, I'm going to, read it to you here. So uh, America must win this war, therefore I will work, I will save, I will sac sacrifice, I will endure, I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost. And if the, and if the issue of the whole struggle depends on me alone. Um, so anyway, we, um, we have it on a committee and uh, we're just kind of fine tuning everything. We have a bunch of letters from Cherokee, Iowa supporting it. Ronald Reagan has used to talk about uh, about this um, the pledge um, with some of his speeches and everything so that's something we hope to hope to get through um, and the last thing would be um, just the length of I know uh, the rail situation is a big concern here with the merger and so um, we do have a bill that basically um, saying that um, a train cannot be any more than 8500 feet in length and so that bill um, we're still working on so there's a few things all right, Senator sure. Reichman. Um, so I'm on rules, appropriations, uh, judicial, veteran, uh, chairman of veteran affairs, and then tech, which is a new pro, new uh, new committee. Um, so in appropriations, as I said, um, our budget is coming out soon, and uh, so it starts off a little slow, and then things develop, and then then come together. Um, judiciary is one I never get questions about in in these settings. So, um, but. You know, lots of things going on there. Um, you know, I, last year I was able to uh, enact uh, um, and make it so that if somebody has a uh, um, no contact order, um, it stays in effect permanently. A person used to have to go back and prove every five years that it would uh, stay valid. So, um, and then this year in that kind of same area, um, if somebody has a domestic they can only look, the judge can't look back past 12 years. So I just ran that out of committee. Um, so, you know, like I said, it, if a judge looked at the sentencing, they could only go back 12 years past that. If you had another incident, they couldn't take that into account. Um, this will help them do that. Um, in uh, veteran affairs, um, several different items. Um, Senator Lofgren have mentioned a few of them. And then in addition to that, we had an, an issue where there's a committee that approves, they have a fund of money. So um, every year, $2.5 million comes in from the lottery. So $2 million of that goes into a fund, the Veterans Trust Fund, that has a target of going to a $50 million um, level, and then it becomes self-funding. So right now what they do is they pull off 500000 of that, and that is allocated for um, veterans that have some kind of financial issue, a, you know, car trouble, you know, a leaky roof, um, dental issues, you know, just kind of wide open, you know, several different items that they can apply for. But last year, what they asked for, because they had, they weren't spending their allocation. So they asked to open it up. So we granted them that. And uh, we um, up the threshold to make it um, more people eligible. And then we hired the cap at, at their, th these went through rules at their request. And uh, unfortunately what that did was opened it wide, so wide open that they drained all the funds out in about the first uh, two months or first two, uh, two quarters and halfway through. And I don't know if anybody's keeping track, but you know, Governor Reynolds was, um, you know, out of her goodness of her heart, um, allocated another 400,000 into that fund um, to, to make it whole so those commitments could be honored but uh, we went from, uh, I got the list of all the allocations and, and payouts of about $2,500 to, hey, let's make it easy and just give everybody 10,000 bucks. And uh, you know, the time, a page after page after page of, of people being awarded $10,000 to 
to, to take care of issues. Um, so um, a bill that's uh, tightening some of that stuff up, uh, making our new uh, um, commandant and veteran affairs director, um, Todd Jacobs, our, uh, make him the final stamp of approval um, so that he sees all that stuff and has an approval so we have somebody um, you know, as the final step. And then uh, some rules to make that also so they can only approve um, a certain amount of it each quarter instead of going through 100% of it in the first two quarters and then not having anything at the end. Um, in tech, a new, as I said, a new committee. So uh, several different things going on in there. Um, um, I introduced the idea and that's going through. Um, our chairman has the bill, but uh, um, I don't know if anybody knows those Apple Air Tags. Are anybody familiar with those? Um, they're being used several times now. Um, you know, uh, a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend um, dropping those in or putting them on a car somewhere, and people being tracked, digitally stocked, and uh, that's led to death in a few di different instances. Mm -hmm. So, um, adding that to the list, you know, just as technology evolves, we got to try to keep up with it. And uh, um, the other thing we did last week in that, that committee was um, for personal security. Um, everybody, I, I'll tell you what, it's scary. If you start having a conversation with somebody and then the next day it pops up on your phone, something that you spoke about, anybody had that happen? Oh, yeah. It's kind of scary. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> obviously, <laughs> Big Brother's watching uh, tech companies, so we, uh, did some legislation and it's it's really um, kind of ahead of the game from other states so to provide us some extra securities and uh, guard our um, identity and the other thing uh, last week we did was um, medical malpractice um, do we have the anybody from the hospital here uh, oh there you are sir there how are you um, so we did medical malpractice and uh, they were they're were happy about that um, you know that's I sit on the floor last week, you know, while we we're passing that, that, that uh, that's not going to be, you know, the only thing that helps the hospitals, but is, is a step. And then uh, um, something I'm proud of for this week is we did the uh, rural emergency hospital. So that's something that the, at the federal level, they passed two years ago, took them two years to get the rules down to us. And then we could finally act on that and uh, have one more step to try to uh, help down here or out in the rural areas. Um, so as you know, I also represent Lee County. Uh, Lee County was the first hospital to go under in about 20 years. And uh, so um, this sets up a structure so they can kind of do a standalone emergency room um, with, with a more limited, you know, some imaging, some um, diagnosis, a smaller staff, not have the, uh, in these rural areas, the burden of having a, a large number of beds available because the, the, as the um, health care has gone to the model of outpatient and, uh, you know, hardly anybody gets a, stays over or for a long period of time anymore. Um, they, they, uh, medicine's advanced enough that they get them in, they do the surgery, um, and when they're, when they're stable and okay, they, they release them. And uh, I'm sure that's not through their their um, own wants. That's something that the uh, insurance companies has encouraged, unfortunately. But uh, people go home, and uh, so they don't have a lot of beds utilized. So having 100 beds tied to a hospital is, is really a burden for them financially, um, keeping that staffed, keeping those, those beds um, refurbished, the area refurbished, you know, refreshed constantly. Um, that's a lot of financial burden for them. So um, this will help reduce that size, that footprint, so help reduce operating cost. Uh, we found out during these subcommittees that there were 12, I think, other hospitals in, in dire financial straits, and about 50% of them are in not, not good standing financially. So um, we, we think these will help um, that hospital structure and help keep them viable and uh, being able to provide care for us out in our rural areas. Thank you. I might, can yep, I add yep, that? Okay, sure. I mentioned earlier. So so as far as with the rural emergency um, hospitals, um, Ken Rosenbooth, myself, we put an amendment on there, but this had to do with the ambulatory surgical centers. 
And then it uh, just has to be about light and have the licensing of them. And then also that uh, the State Board of Health will end up making rules. But I think one of the biggest thing is right now, if you have a problem with the surgical center, um, you basically the Department of Inspection Appeals has to get a hold of CMS and get their approval uh, to investigate. But now what happens is the way this is set up, they won't have to do that anymore. If they if they find that there's problems that they feel, they can go ahead and go directly and investigate without going through CMS. So we think that's a big deal. So, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that was a, that was a Jeff did a nice job on that bill. That was good. All right, so I think we're going to open it up for questions. So Stephen, go ahead. We have one question in the chat. It's been proven that social emotion learning is important when raising and teaching resilient children. There's a bill in the state Senate to ban SEL from our schools. If that occurs, do you see the need for mental health services to increase in our community? And how would we combat that? My turn. I mean, I'll, you can go ahead. Sure. Well, that's a tough question because, first of all, I'm not on education. Second of all, I don't know what it is, and I'm not familiar with it. So, um, I, I don't even know how to approach that question because um, I'm not aware of it. And it, you know, when it's, when it's going through the subcommittees, um, even the even the committee, the, the sub, and, and through the committee process, you know, we are not familiar with a lot of things. I, I know probably one of the other questions we'll have today is about SNAP. And, uh, you know, that's probably one of the, the second most question I've had this this year and probably the biggest fiasco somebody created for us. And I'd like to personally thank the person who filed that for them. Um, so I, I don't know what to say about this or what it is or and, and if it's uh, any but any person can file any bill. Um, in any uh, legislator. So uh, we have some that file some that, that are like, hey, great idea. And then we have some others are like, what the heck are you doing? And thanks for creating this turmoil. Um, I don't know what that is. So I don't know how to answer that question. I apologize. Right. What I what I understand is some of the, uh, the chair and some of the people involved in education, uh, they think there's some good parts to that. But I think like everything, maybe they've gone too far. So uh, there's Sandy Salmon, who's a senator, and she's she's looking at that, um, trying to e either eliminate or do some changes to it. So, um, so I no, I think um, most likely something will probably happen on that bill. All right. And and that's thank yeah. you. That, that's one of the things. And and I think people, a person has an idea and they come out with it, and then they, you know, they think it's the greatest, but. Through that subcommittee and committee process, when with talking to um, during the sub, you have people, um, all the different uh, lobbyists and and people who have interest in it, um, come in and are able to speak. So we can kind of shape it. Um, for instance, I had one last week. Um, it was an intimidation, so witness intimidation, and it, the way it was written, it was to become a class B felon. So during the subcommittee process. Um, the uh, people mentioned, hey, why don't you just up it one step instead of making a felon and putting everybody in jail, um, have it have it go up a step from the original offense. And uh, so that, yeah, great idea that was taken. So um, to Mark's point, um, you know, they came out with the original bill, I think during the sub process and some discussions that'll probably be uh, um, made better. Um, that's what the process is for. All right, so Stephen has a question from the audience. I, I have more of a comment than a question. Uh -huh. I want to express appreciation to Senator Reichman for his advocacy for a reinvest in Iowa infrastructure fund grant. I know you're doing it. I know it's making a difference. It'll really help the Capitol Theater and our downtown community. So thank you for doing that. And then the other thing would be in uh, Kikuk and Burlington, there are Ukrainian refugee families who have moved here, and there's more that want to come. And next Thursday, the woman who uh, runs the refugee resettlement agency that has Southeast Iowa will be speaking at the public library at 530. So we'd like to invite both y'all to attend if you're able to be back in our community. Thank you. Other question? 
So while you mentioned SNAP, I'd like to know, I, <laughs> I'm with Community Action and we have a food pantry in the five county area. Um, we are moving more food out the door and I'm curious how much money the state is gonna spend adding more barriers to families being able, eligible for SNAP. Um, so that was created and, and I asked, I'm like, what in the heck are they doing? I went to Senator Edler because he's our side, Senate Health and Human Services. And uh, um, I don't know, I don't know who, draft, do you know who drafted it on the, on the House side? It came out of the House. And uh, maybe Schultz. Yeah. Or, or no, it came out of the House oh, side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they said, we developed a shell bill to start the conversation. I'm like, well, they started it. Good job. Because they, they really started it. And uh, so, I mean, first of all, the biggest thing was eliminating, I mean, they went to the federal standard and I think that was the easy way to go. Hey, if the feds are doing it, we'll do it too um, with WIC, right? So they used that as a model. Um, the biggest thing was to tighten up some of the requirements. And I, I, same thing, this is going through, a, and it has to go through a big process because um, this is a hot potato and I don't even wanna to touch it right now. Um, so it, it needs a lot of work, and I don't know where that's going. Um, I think I think they will tighten up some of the requirements, and I, you know, through the last uh, few years with COVID, you know, a lot of those restrictions have been taken off, have been opened up, and uh, it, you know, with the federal funds that have flowed into the state, we are not even allowed to take anybody off Medicaid. Somebody can win the lottery, literally win the lottery, and you're not allowed to take them off Medicaid. So people are, you know, more people are back to work. Um, you know, uh, you know, salaries are increasing, um, hourly pay is increasing, and there should be people theoretically less on Medicaid, less on on receiving benefits, um, but that's not happening. So that is the, um, I guess, the design of it, but um, it needs work. It needs a lot of work. I, I agree with Jeff that sometimes there's these bills come out and then all of a sudden you read things in the paper and we're the same. We're like, oh my God, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> so, um, and you know, remember this though, only like, what is it, 10, 12% of the bills that are, are put out there end up passing. So, I mean, it's, it's a small percentage. So, you know, we'll see, and we'll see what happens on that. All right, another question. Yep. Good morning. So um, Mark is used to me asking a lot of questions about Medicaid, and I have one today. So I know there's legislators looking at um, doing an increase so that um, agencies that get, take Medicaid will have an inflationary or a COLA type increase um, every year so that we don't have to go every single year and beg for increases in our rates because with inflation, we too struggle with trying to cover our services. So are you all looking at that and have you considered um, adding that to any bill or filing anything on that? I, I like that. The only thing I would say is we're, neither one of us are on human resources. So that's, that's the only thing. So what happens is we kind of work in our area, then all of a sudden they get through the, the subcommittee and get through the committee. And then we, then we take a look at when it goes to the floor. So, um, so I, don't, I, I haven't heard that much about that, but uh, to me, it would make some sense. Yeah, and we can reach out to Senator Edler and Senator Costello, the, the vice chair, um, and, and ask them specifically about that. I know it's been mentioned. I, I've heard you say that before. So um, I'll, I'll reach out to them and see what they say. And uh, it, it would make sense. Um, it's tough for us to keep up with inflation because it's, you know, what is it? Uh, last time I heard it was at a 40-year high. Um, so um, to pin something to inflation and try to keep up with it, it's, it's difficult and uh, um, short term drains the reserves that we have. Um, so we're trying to, you know, just like everybody, I know, I, you know, there's lots of things I'm tightening up my belt on, you know, um, eating at home or uh, cut off my cable and, and doing these things at home myself. So I know everybody's doing that. And I think they say consumer spending's down. So I know everybody's doing that. Um, so it's a tough situation and we're trying to weather through this and hope that uh, um, this gets lined out quickly because it's, it's causing a lot of people pain, people on fixed income. And uh, if you're running an organization, your budget is your fixed income, right? So it's, it's, it's tough on everyone. Um, and, and certain something I'll reach out to 
to them to HHS about and see um, what they have to say. Could we go back to that SNAP question again? So uh, Taylor Collins, um, who couldn't come here, I think I think he might still be in Des Moines, but he mentioned that um, that it was being amended to just focus on uh, candy and pop only. So um, apparently there was a part of this part of the stuff that was in there was more of a drafting error. So so anyway, obviously we're still we're still working on it. Right. Yeah, and we can give Taylor kind of a hard time. I think he's listening, so we can give him a yeah, hard he's time. On there. Oh yeah, <laughs> because All right. I was driving. He'll probably send me something here. I counted say. twenty. <laughs> I counted twenty-two cars in the ditch as I went by yeah. last yesterday afternoon, um, driving home, including a jackknife truck. But so I'm going to give Taylor kind of a hard time, <laughs> and I will brag about my driving skills. And you can you can ask uh, Renee about that because we uh, narrowly avoided some situations. But uh, I'm just going to give Taylor a hard time for not making it back, and, and I was able to drive home. All right, another question. Uh, Senator Reichman, I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but it's my understanding that we're looking at potential sales tax reform that results in basically the removal of the local option sales tax with replacement of something that would trigger the Natural Resource Trust Fund. Um, what's the likelihood of us seeing that happen? Um, well, that's been something that's been going on for, I think, about the last 10 years. They've been talking about it, right? And... Uh, I think it's 50 50. Um, uh, Dan's one that Dan Dawson, the, the uh, chairman of um, Ways and Means, is, is one of those who file stuff to trigger some conversation. And uh, um, so that I don't know where that's at. And to do both of those at the same time, um, I don't know what that would do. So um, it's one that's going through the process, and I, there's some concerns there. I know um, Farm Bureau has always had some concerns with it and uh, what that would potentially do um, for other departments and allow them to accomplish um, with the extra revenue they would receive from it. So um, there's eyes on that and needs to be some additional constraints. Um, so I, I couldn't tell you where that, what, what, how close they are to making something that would come to the floor and, and receive the number of votes that it needs. In our caucus, we asked about that, whether that was going to be in our property tax bill, which they felt it was, should be a separate bill anyway. So, um, but Dan, you know, like, like you said, Dan said, they're still, they're still working on that. So we'll see what happens. And so many things they, you know, they, they, like I said, they come out with the best idea or their, their best, their ideal resolution to it. And then, uh, you know, they, they have enough people going, uh-uh, and no, that's the, no, we're not going to vote for that, that it, uh, it usually ends up, you know, getting watered down. Um, so that just hasn't gotten watered down to a taste for us yet. So um, it's still, still being worked on. All right. So that, that comes to a conclusion today. So we want to thank you both for here, being here. Appreciate your conversations and, um, your participation this morning. So thank you to everyone in the room. Um, and then mark your calendars for the next Friday forum on March 17th. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Have a great day.